can we start off by talking about the narration? Uh, I'm very curious about when that came about and the role it plays. Um, it came about in a somewhat um, fortuitous way. The, what I said earlier before the screening was that I had commissioned the, the screenplay from Masawa Dachi and a few weeks later, Koji Wakamatsu, who was the important uh, Japanese avant-garde filmmaker who Adachi had worked with for a long time, um, died in uh, uh, run over by a cab in, in Tokyo. And this obviously was a very difficult moment for Adachi, who had spent many years working with um, Wakamatsu, and so he was very busy doing, uh, taking care of, uh, of uh, organizing a retrospective and, and sort of um, mourning his friend, and so he wasn't writing the screenplay. Uh, and so a week before I was scheduled to go to Beirut, or two weeks before I was scheduled to go to Beirut, I decided to go to Tokyo and to see where things stood. And we did what we had done for the previous film, which is sit in a room for two or three days. I realized he hadn't written anything outside of the initial proposition, which he had sent me at the beginning of the exchange when he had essentially given me a, a very rough framework for the film, which was the character of Lili, the character of Michel, uh, the story of their fragmented memory, Elena, and this uh, event that either occurred or did not occur. But he hadn't really pursued it further than that. And so we sat in a room, and I just talked to him for a few days, and we recorded. And then uh, when I left Tokyo, he went ahead and wrote the screenplay. He writes, I think he's always written his screenplays in, in two or three days. Um, with a bottle of whiskey and a very short time. Um, and then when I arrived in Beirut, I received the screenplay, and as he had promised, it was an unfilmable screenplay. And then uh, I uh, sat down with uh, Dor Vermeer, who's somebody who I work with on, on, on several projects, and we sort of took this script, uh, mixed it up with um, the things that I had recorded in Tokyo as a voiceover, and kind of restructured the film um, around some of the things that you've seen that are clearly not part of the original screenplay, but that are more about the process of making the film. And we've sort of added some components and decided that the, the voiceover would help me sort of um, stitch together these various parts of the film that were sort of in between our experience in the previous film, the, the, his proposition in, the, in, in, in his screenplay, and the process of making it. In the dinner party scene, which is very powerful, and I, I, I feel kind of resonant to anyone who's been in any kind of, uh, um, not even revolutionary, but you know, any any kind of an act activist or you know, any kind of movement or moment, um, and seeing the aftermath. But um, in the beginning of it, uh, the argument about Syria, there's this, it feels to me like uh, there's this merging uh, for a moment of the of the voiceover, you know, of the narr narration with the film, which is otherwise much more elliptical. Um, maybe you could talk about that scene a bit. Well, the one thing I knew that I was going to want to do with the voiceover and then with the dinner scene is that I wanted to build into the film itself the idea that the characters in the film are caught in between the idea of a script writer and the process of making the film that is controlled by the director and that the characters would be sort of trapped in between. So the voiceover at the beginning will, so they got, for example, the scene in the bed, uh, which was not part of Adachi's initial screenplay, is somewhat representative of the sort of, uh, in French we say, je t'aime moi non plus, like I love you, I don't love you. And, um, and, and, and the disjointedness of a, narr of a narrator who is describing something, but what we are seeing on screen is something else would set the tone. And that after a while, I wanted to sort of, um, how would you say, liberate the characters from the narrator. And then they would sort of exist in these multiple planes, where at some times they are the characters that the narrator is describing, at other times they are the actors, and at other times they are people from Beirut with their own experiences dealing with a situation which is the present. Um, and the present at that time was, and it probably still is, is the civil war in Syria. And since um, I wanted the film to, to, to come back to the now, 
I think that w it wouldn't just be a film about the, the 70s and, and, and 80s and that era of struggle, but I wanted to bring those questions back to uh, a different situation, which is ideologically and politically, structurally very uh, different than what um, people were fighting around a generation ago. And, and the dinner scene was the opportunity to sort of orchestrate that. And, and all of the, uh, the casting in Beirut was done specifically with this dinner scene in mind. In other words, the actors that I saw, what we mostly talked about was their experience of the war. Um, all of them are former members of the, of the uh, Lebanese Communist Party, and all of them had sort of a different trajectory. Um, some of them are outside of politics, some of them are uh, very close to Hezbollah, which is a very typical sort of trajectory, even though it seems strange from our perspective that you could go from a, uh, a non-religious communist organization to a religious form of resistance. Um, and I wanted to sort of represent these different perspectives in a, in a scene that would be um, largely improv-based, um, but that could bring it to the here and the now. Um, can you talk about the function of language? Um, this is such a polyglot film, um, and the choice, um, you know, especially for Michelle, for Michel, um, the way he comes off in the three different languages that he speaks, um, is very interesting, and you, you just add, adds a lot of um, it, it. It adds a lot to the pacing and the rhythm, and sort of it, it takes you out of it and then back into it. And I don't know, maybe you could talk about the choice uh, to make it st such a polyglot film. Uh, filming in Beirut, I don't speak Arabic, so they the uh, I have notions of Arabic, but certainly not enough to understand uh, what they're talking about. I have some notions of Japanese, but certainly not enough to understand what Adachi tells me when we sit in a room for three days. Um, <laughs> and on the and also I I sp uh, I'm spent half of my life here and half of my life in France, and the and and most of the people are very close to me. I speak to them in French and in English, sort of interchangeably, and so I. Want, I've been interested in the idea of a film where dialogue would be in each character's language, like fundamental language, uh, the, the language closest to them. And so Adachi would speak Japanese, the Lebanese characters would speak Arabic when they are not in the presence of Lili, who does not speak Arabic. Um, Lili would speak French because it's the language that's closest to her, and Michel would speak English because his English is better than his French. And so this sort of disjointed communication that happens when you speak in different languages um, would was something I was interested in, in, in building in because the, from the onset these projects are always very much based on the loss of something in the language um, barriers or the, uh, the ability to, I think Adachi and I understand each other very, very well and yet we don't have a common language and this is something I find quite interesting. Um, I think in some extent, to some extent, the Lebanese <coughs> people I've worked with over the course of the past two films and I understand each other very well even though we don't have a complete overlap in our <coughs> languages. And I just was interested in seeing what that would do in the, at the level of a film. Um, we can start taking some questions if you have them. Yes. Uh, you just mentioned uh, that you really wanted to challenge how much the, the story was around the 70s and 80s and you wanted to bring it in the here and now. How much do you feel that Kadachi, which is in the here and now, lives in the here and now, kind of is moving forward in that? I was, cause I was interested in that quote he has around regret and the existence of the future. Mm -hmm. well, I think you said it, you answered it. Um, Can you repeat the question? Um, okay. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the question is how much, I guess, how much Eric fe feels that Adachi is living in the present or uh, holding on to the past? I, I th you know, there's a lot of people who are engaged in revolutionary struggle in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s whose posture, if you look at sort of, you know, the people in the Red Brigades in Italy who've had very specific postures relative to the past. It can either be one of renouncement and sort of rejecting the, 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 the course of action that was taken, or and sometimes that will lead all the way to a sort of very extreme form of collaborating with authorities and denouncing former comrades. Um, the Italians also invented this idea of dissociation, which is that you do not necessarily renounce your past, but you dissociate yourself from it, or you are unrepentant. Adachi brought I think he has a, a very interesting position relative to his own past. 
which is that he says the things that occurred occurred because of the circumstances and sort of the historical circumstances in which they occurred, and that there is no excuses to be made for these decisions, um, even though today in a different geopolitical context the decisions would probably be different. What I am interested in in his position is exactly what you said, is this idea, I mean he says two things in the film that I think are very interesting. The first is he says, society describes me as an ex-terrorist, I don't think the prefix ex applies to terrorists. And that's a very interesting position for somebody in his, in, in his situation to, to express. And the other one is that he's only interested in the notion of regret insofar as regret um, speaks to the future. And I think that that is what is, I think that my, my interest in Adachi comes from that perspective. Is that I think there's something about our relationship from one generation to another um, that is not about nostalgia. It's about understanding what his generation did so that our generation can learn from it and be in the present. Um, and then sort of more technically, but Adachi is a Trotskyist, so he believes in permanent revolution, which means that he believes that the revolution is a cycle that occurs every single day. And so he's always in the present. And I think today, even, even though his positions may evolve relative to um, and you know, his position might be different than mine relative to the war in Syria, for example. But, um, but he reevaluates this idea of a permanent revolution constantly. And so he, um, I think he would probably not agree with certain aspects of the film. I know he doesn't agree with certain aspects of the film, but he fundamentally agrees with the proposition of the film, which is that it be brought back to the present. Um, if you could talk also about, um, sort of on that note, the musical choices, uh, which are off, uh, inspired by a lot of classic uh, 70s, more radical revolutionary films. There's, the, there's the, 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 the sort of the electronic music at the beginning of the film is a, it's like a 15 second sample at the end of Ice by Robert Kramer in the newsreel film. Um, and, just, you know, a very important film for me in terms of sort of making a, a revolutionary, a, a sort of a science fiction revolutionary proposition um, and a film about resistance. And the other, then there's two other uh, tracks in the film. There's uh, music by Julius Eastman, uh, who was a composer uh, who lived in New York, who, who, who died in, a, uh, you know, as, as almost as a homeless person, but had been an extremely... Um, interesting avant-garde uh, contemporary music composer and who had a song, who had, who had composed um, works and who considered himself a guerrilla fighter, a gay guerrilla fighter, and who said that, you know, he, he hoped that he would be worthy of, of, of um, um, devoting his life to a form of struggle. And the um, last music in the film is the uh, is the uh, the scene in the nightscape uh, in Beirut, um, which is the the a song that Adachi had written for a film by Koji Wakamatsu, which is the last film that he wrote as a screenplay writer, and it was called Ecstasy of the Angels, and it was very much a film about revolutionaries um, um, reaching a point of sort of nihilistic um, self destruction, and this is the opening song of that film, and I wanted to build that in and I think it's a beautiful song. Um, anecdotally that story about the, um, the in Tokyo I knew you were talking I knew it was about Tokyo even though I had, didn't know the story but I'm like that must be Tokyo they must be talking about that the Japanese restaurant but is that a true that's like a, is that what, what inspired you to incorporate that into the story? Did, did you hear the question in the back? Okay. Um, is the the story about Tokyo, the Japanese restaurant? Is that is it true? But it's it's exactly. I mean, it it, it it's true in the sense that no. It, yeah, I mean, it is true in the sense that all of it is true. The the the, the first truth is that Adachi one night when I was in Tokyo and we had finished doing the interviews and we were out having dinner, um, we were talking about the Anabasis, the previous film, and I had sh I had shot images of the Tokyo restaurant in Beirut. I think at the time it was the Toko restaurant because the Y had yeah, fallen. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and he offhandedly said, yeah, th I, I own that restaurant. And I was, if you're spending 30 years clandestine in a country like Beirut, you are running one of two Japanese restaurants and nobody <laughs> finds you. And I was amazed. And so I sort of 
took this ad, a, a, I took it with a grain of salt, and then he told me this story about the Japanese um, diplomats coming there, dancing, finding a gun, playing with the gun, shooting the gun, and killing the wife of one of the diplomats. But I sort of took this story as maybe one of these apocryphal stories that one tells after too many drinks. And, um, but the thing about Adachi is that he doesn't lie. <laughs> And I should know this by now, but the story is just not very credible. And so uh, in Beirut, I, I, I Googled it, and I found an article in an American newspaper from the AP that said that, yes, the Japanese diplomat had been shot in the head in, uh, in the Toko restaurant, the Tokyo restaurant. And, um, and so this is one of, and in the same way, the other, you know, the other thing that happens in this scene with uh, Lili, who sort of orchestrates this moment of the, the visit with the shrink and he and Michel loses his bearings. He's not sure what sh w where she is, whether she's playing or whether she is in character or whether she is actually lost. And he he's, is also something that occurred during the casting when I was doing a casting call in Paris and I was seeing several actresses. This scene did occur. I didn't have a script at the time. I just had the framework for a script and so it was very difficult to do to cast the part. And so I had the actresses do these sort of impro improvisations and, and it was the first time I worked with actors in an improvisational context and so this occurred. I'm, I, was the, I was Michelle. I had no idea whether she was actually losing her bearings in the, in the and sort of embarrassing for me to admit this, but I, had n I didn't know whether she was acting or not. And, um, uh, and so these are things that, that, that occurred in the fabrication of the film that I wanted to bring back into the film. Um, but yes, I, th I think this did occur in, in, in Beirut. Yes, in the back. Yeah, these are, these are just a couple of observations, but um, one thing that I found very interesting, and I think part of it is that I, I got a chance to see both of the films, um, is that there is this theme of revolution between generations, and there's also uh, something of a subtext of um, Adashi's experience, or uh, the refugee experience, and an interlacing of those two things that I found very, very interesting. Now, I, I don't think I could really tie it together, but I also found Beirut as an extraordinarily interesting character, in, especially in the second film. Um, and I was, I was just astonished by two shots that you that you had in the film. One was the beginning um, with all the, I'm not sure what it was, but all the electrical cable running through the streets, um, which kind of evoked, you know, this Adachi's voiceover with this uh, Middle Eastern experience, this Arabic experience. And then later on in the movie, th there was, um, they were in a ruin and there were all these pipes that were disconnected. Uh, and I just see those two shots together. Um, I'm not sure if it was intended that way, but they were just extraordinary shots. I can't get out of my mind. The, the, the prelude to the film takes, is filmed in the Sabran Chatila refugee camps in, in Beirut. So those are the um, one of three important uh, Palestinian communities in Beirut that sort of um, it's shown actually in the first film, but it's there. There's images of Sabra and Shatila in the Anabasis from the 1970s, when it's just a few houses on a beautiful hillside, and there's plenty of space and plenty of air, and there's trees, and that's where Adachi lived for and May lived for for several years when they were um, hiding. Um, they lived in the in the in the refugee camp, and as refugee camps tend to do, they just sort of build on top of each other uh, of themselves, and then eventually there's no more space. And so you have these very thin corridors, <coughs> and the electricity is just a sort of a hack. Everything, people just run wires, and... Um, yeah, it looks like a favela. It is. I mean, it, yeah. it's one of the densest populated areas in the world. It's a very small place, Sabah and Shatila. It's, I think it's uh, like 300 meters by 70 meters, and uh, maybe 300,000 people live there. Um, 
I wanted to film in Sabra and Chatila also because the, the way the prologue works is it's sort of a transition between the two films. It, it's, it starts very much like the, the landscape theory that we talked about in the previous film. It's very much sort of about using the camera to show the, the, the something you know about the structure of, of the political situation in a, in a, and, and so I wanted the prologue to be like a, the, the last chapter of the Anabasis in a way. And the other architecture that you are talking about is um, it's in Tripoli, in the north of Beirut, uh, north of, of um, Lebanon, and it's uh, it's an Oscar Niemeyer um, architecture. It's a very large place that was built for a world fair that never actually was finished, but it's a modernist utopian architecture that is incomplete. And there is something sort of greatly ambitious about this. Um, architectural project in, in, in Lebanon of, uh, of a, a communist architect uh, who had this sort of total vision for something but that was never fully um, in existence. It was never completed. Um, and I felt like it would be important to shoot something in there based on this sort of ambitious idea of a total architecture. So the question is about uh, the choice to to focus uh, on filming locations that were kind of in construction or in the process of ruins, sort of in between them. One of the things I'd set out to do was I was hoping to, with a very small budget, to make a film that it wouldn't be temporally specific. In other words, be, and, and partially because of the narrative and because the narrative and, and the in the original Adachi script, it doesn't make sense from a you can't really date the screenplay, whether it would, I mean, it, if you sort of do the math as to what these people are talking about, the film would have to take place somewhere between the 90s and the early 2000s, but probably not today. Um, uh, just arithmically, it wouldn't work out. And so I tried to shoot as much as possible in locations that wouldn't necessarily speak of 2013 in Beirut. Th that, that was one thing. Um, the second thing is, um, and you know, maybe this doesn't have make much sense from a theoretical standpoint, but most of the locations are locations that I had already used in the Anabasis. All the interiors are the same apartments. Um, they're just filmed very differently. But um, all of the interiors in Beirut and the Anabasis are these interiors, and it's just the house that I stay in when I live there. Um, And aside from that, it's just the beach, but it's really, there's very few locations in a way. I mean, I mean, there's the, there's, um, um, there's the, the sort of the, the intimate space, which is their space, and then there's the mysterious space where this event occurred, which is the, 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 the this bombed out shelter. Um, the beaches, and then Sabah and Shatila, and then aside from that, there are some landscapes that are somewhere, the, the, the road between Beirut and, and Tripoli. But, um, I think, and this might be a strange way to, 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 to express a choice of locations for making one film, but I think the choice of locations for this film was very much tied to the choice of locations for the previous film. And that having some kind of binding or ties between the two seemed important to me. Um, and so uh, just as a final question, do you plan to continue working with, Asa with, with the Dachi and or continuing this? What th what's now kind of a diptych? Um, Uh, there's been opportunity, or people have expressed interest in maybe uh, financing or a, a third opus or a third like chunk or chapter, whatever, um, to the to the project. I think if there were to be a third um, piece, I think what I would simply want it to be is just helping Adachi produce his own film, and so maybe just channeling uh, whatever finances are available. He hasn't made a film since. 
2006. He shot a film in 2006 when he came out of prison. And, um, uh, and I think he, he would love to make a film. And uh, I think the third one would just be maybe I would function as his producer or just find the, 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 the or, or do whatever he would want to do. But I don't think that I have a third film that I would want to do with him. I think the third film would have to be his. Thanks so much. That's great. Thank you.